we go then. Okay, now today we want to start talking about joints. And so, the most obvious thing is on this first slide where we say that a joint just joins together two bones, and that's all there is to it. Now, how do we classify them? Well, there's two ways to classify joints. One is according to their structure. And there are three types here. We can have fibrous joints, which are made basically of collagen fibers, more than likely than anything else. We can have cartilaginous joints, and they're going to be cartilage, so they're either going to be hyaline cartilage or a combination of hyaline cartilage and fibrate cartilage. Okay? And then, the most numerous joint in the body is the last one, then, the synovial joints. And those are the ones that are going to have a fluid-filled cavity within them. Okay? So, fibrous, basically just collagen fibers, cartilaginous, either hyaline cartilage or a combo of hyaline and fibrin cartilage, and synovial, which are the ones that actually have a fluid-filled cavity within them and the synovial joints being actually the most numerous joint in the body. Now, another way to classify joints is according to their degree of movement, how much movement you can get. All right, three classifications here, three categories. Synarthrotic, sin just means to join together. So a synarthrotic joint is immobile. There's no movement. The two bones are tightly bound together and aren't allowed to move with respect to one another. Amphiarthrotic, amphi basically means both, but essentially amphi is slight movement, slight movement of the bones. Very limited, but a little bit of movement. And then finally, diarthrotic indicates they are freely movable. Now, the degree of motion you get, how far they move and all that, well, that varies. But these are considered to be the most freely movable of any, any type of joint. And for a little uh, mixing and matching, if it's a synovial joint, it's diarthrotic when it comes to movement. All synovial joints, movement-wise, are diarthrotic joints. Okay? All right, so fibrous joints, as we said, dense fibrous connective tissue. That's what they are, that's what they're made of and they tend to pull the bones pretty closely together, in some cases, more so than others. There are three types of these, and you're going to love all these names. Sin desmosis, kind of like stitched together, uh, suture, and gonfosis. That's not the prettiest word of all, really. Okay, well, I'll say that there's only one case for it anyway. Sin desmosis, sutures, gonfosis. Those are the three types, subtypes, if you will, of joints that are fibrous joints. All right? So in all cases, they're collagen fibers, basically, is what they're made of. Well, let's look at the syndesmosis first. All right. A broad band of collagen fibers that join two bones together, forming what we can call an interosseous ligament. Ligaments joint bone with bone. So, in essence, they're kind of extensions, if you will, of the periosteum. You know, it's, it's essentially uh, on the outside collagen fibers, and so these just kind of extend from one to the other and bind the bones together. Now, with this kind, we have what's called an amphiarthrotic joint. So, what? Slightly movable, right? Usually they can bend and twist a little bit with respect to one another. Depends on how long those collagen fibers are. The longer they are, the more movement you can get. But they're not going to allow a lot of movement. Not much more, not much more really than kind of a twisting. Good example, the distal tibia fibular joint. Tibia fibular joint. Down here at the ankle, where the tibia and fibula are found, Together, there's a little interosseous ligament between the two, allows the two bones to have slight movement with respect to one another. Okay? All right, that's a good example then 
of a sin as Moses type of joint. Now, here is a graphic showing that. Here's the tibia and the fibula. There is that little interosseous ligament. It's nothing more than just a bundle of collagen fibers. Let's the two bones uh, move very slightly with respect to one another. And about all you're going to get is kind of a bending, twisting kind of movement. All right? Now, a suture. Now, we all know what that is. Those are found really between the adjacent skull bones. So if you have, let's say, between the frontal bone and the parietal bone, or the two parietal bones, or you know, any two that you care to name, you got it. And so here we go, these two parietal bones are joined together by sutures, our sutural ligaments as we can call them. And here is a bit of frontal bone, and you can see, you know, the, the sawtooth-like ridges here where the bones fit together. And then in those ridges where the two are together, there will be little collagen fibers, a whole bunch of collagen fibers, knitting the bones tightly together. Now, how much movement do we get? None. They are synarthrotic joints. All right? And as you can see there, uh, you know, if I'll pass that around and take a look at it. Now, the thing, of course, with that is that the uh, collagen fibers are long since gone. But you can see how the bones fit together like interlocking jigsaw puzzle pieces because of their complementary shape. And so here we have you know, two bones, flat bones of the skull. There's the connective tissue and a little gap between where they fit together, which cements them together, let's say, more tightly than they otherwise would be. And they really fit together pretty tightly as it is. And here we actually have some photographs like that frontal bone that we're passing around. You can see the jagged sawtooth-like. Uh, notches, and of course, then the other bone that this would fit would have a complementary shape, so those fit tightly together, and then there would actually be collagen fibers in between all of these, uh, all of these spaces. What are these little bones here called? Sutural bones. Excellent. That's first person on the three lectures that's asked the question, so you are honored. All right, very good. All right. Now, gomphosis. Prettiest name of all. Teeth. That's what holds your teeth in the jaws. Okay? Gomphosis. Union of a cone-shaped process and a bony socket. And it's your teeth. That's what holds your teeth in place. And so, that... Uh, Stitching together can be called a periodontal ligament besides a gomphosis, but I, I think gomphosis is such a pretty word, don't you? All right, and they are, I would hope, synarthrotic joints, because what happens if they allow movement? What happens to your teeth? They fall out, right. And remember with scurvy, one of the things that happened with the loss of teeth, why? because vitamin C was necessary for collagen synthesis. Remember that? Mm -hmm. All right, so there we go. All right, so there we are. Gomphosis, that's the kind of joint that holds the teeth in the jaw. And it's just a cartilaginous joint. It's synarthrotic. It doesn't allow for movement. And here we have a diagram. And so this little space, all these little lines, will be part of that periodontal ligament or the gomphosis that is actually combining or connecting the two to the jaw bone itself. And, and so, you know, there you go. Of course, you get gum disease and you have an erosion of a lot of that. If you're not careful, you don't want that. All right, so there we go. There's the gomphosis. Now, Let's take a look at some cartilaginous joints. All right, so these are going to be made of cartilage. And as we said, it's either hyaline cartilage or it's a combination of hyaline and fibrocartilage. cartilage. And there are two types of these. And these are, again, lovely names. 
Send chondrosis back, get out your terminological dissecting kit. Sins to join together with the con comes from cartilage. So it's joined together by way of cartilage that gives it away. Alright, and then the synthesis, which eh, I forget what that means, but it's it's a joining together as well. Well, we know where those are. Alright, sin chondrosis. Let's take a look at that one first. Alright, typically bands of hyaline cartilage to join together bones. And actually can be joined together parts of bones because when it comes to the sin chondrosis, there are some that are temporary and there are some that are permanent. Now, the temporary is one that should warm the cockles of your hearts as we've already talked about. Do you remember the growth plate of cartilage in long bones? Well, that growth plate of cartilage, that epiphyseal plate of cartilage, is a temporary sin chondrosis joint. Right? Because how long is it there? Until about age 25. By age 25, remember, it ossifies and disappears. You know, it may even happen a little before that. All right. Now, the epiphyseal plates of long bones are examples of sin chondrosis that are temporary. And they are centerthrotic joints, no movement. We don't want any movement. If you get movement, what happens? Well, yeah, you can have a break, and you can also end up with bones that either grow in a distorted manner or shape, or they don't grow at all, depending on how much damage you cause. No, you don't want it, you don't want to, you want to preserve that as long as it's there. All right, others are permanent, and here's a good example of one of those, and that is between the first rib and the sternum. The joint between the first rib and the new rib of the sternum is a synchondrosis that is permanent. That one should last you throughout your life, and again, it is a centerthrotic joint. There's no movement. Now, that's not going to be true with the other ribs. But with the first rib, the joint that attaches it to the new rib of the sternum is uh, an immobile joint. And it's just hyaline cartilage, basically, is all it is. All right? Now, here we have that one shown in this diagram. The first rib, the coastal cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage, joining it to the maneuvering of the sternum that is forming an immobile or centerthrotic joint. Okay? Now, synthesis, well, these are a thin layer of hyaline cartilage covering a thicker pad of fibroid cartilage. Okay? So, mostly fibroid cartilage, a little bit of a thin veneer on the top and bottom, let's say, of Highland cartilage. Now, where do we find these? Well, the synthesis pubis, or pubic synthesis is one. Where do you find that? What bones do you find the synthesis pubis between? The two pubis bones, right? Yeah, because remember, you've got the coxal bone, which is made of three fused bones. What were the three fused bones that make up the coxal bone? Ilium, ischium, yes, and pubis. All right. And so this holds the two coxal bones anteriorly together, forms a joint between them, and it really is joining the two pubis bones. All right. And it is a thick pad of fiber cartilage little thin covering hyaline cartilage on the surface. Now, this one is more or less permanent, but it does tend to narrow as you age, because I think we said in the lab, that's one way of determining the age of skeletal remains is the width of that pubic synthesis. Okay? Now, there's another good place to find, to find a synthesis, even though we don't call it that, it's not part of the name, and that's the intervertebral discs. So I just pass that around. That model comes in handy for more than just osteoporosis. So there you go. And once again, what have we got? Well, those intervertebral discs are thick pans of fibrocartilage covered over top and bottom 
with a thin veneer of highland cartilage. All right? There we go. Now, what about a synthesis? Is it mobile or not? Yeah, it's got some mobility, but it's more or less anti-arthrotic. So, slight movement. I mean, remember, with the synthesis pubis, if you're female, it would better be able to move a little bit so you can give birth. And what about these uh, intervertebral discs? Well, you do want to have some mobility of your spine, do you not? All right. Okay, so there we go. All right, simple enough, is a bit. And yes, it's complicated about that. All right. Synovial joints. Now, these are a bit more complicated, but yet they're fairly simple in a sense. In a sense. All are, and we've already said this, diarthrotic, which means what? Freely movable. Freely movable. All right, now, basic parts to a synovial joint. There's an articular cartilage that covers the epiphyseal ends of bone. Lady of the seal ends on long bones. There is a fibrous joint capsule that encloses the joint. All right? So all the other parts are inside of it. And really, that joint capsule is, is a ligament of sorts, and it's kind of contiguous, really, with the periosteum of the two bones that are joined together. All right? Just remember, the periosteum is that fibrous covering on the outside of the bone. And this just extends on uh, as a capsule. All right, and then there's a synovial membrane inside that lines most of it, although not all. And that synovial membrane is what secretes the fluid, the synovial fluid, that you find inside the joint. All right? So, let's take a look at the diagram of a Oh, generic, I guess we could say, a representative diagram of a synovial joint. All right, here we have the two bones that are joined together. And obviously, in the epiphyseal ends of the bone, we largely have spongy bone, right? It's covered over with just a thin veneer of compact bone. And on the epiphyseal end of the bone is this little remnant of cartilage Highland cartilage called the articular cartilage. And remember now, that is all the cartilage that is normally left following ossification uh, once the epiphyseal cartilage has, has ossified. That's still there. Uh, and that should remain throughout life. If it doesn't, well, then you'll probably end up with arthritis, which is just the inflammation of the joint. If you grind it away, it is not replaced. All right, so there we have that. Now, here is the capsule. It is largely dense fibers connecting tissue. It's essentially collagen fibers on the outside and a looser connective tissue on the inside. And then we have this dark blue line that would represent the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane is what is going to filter the blood and produce the synovial fluid that fills the joint cavity. All right, and in light blue, what have we got? We've got the joint cavity filled with that synovial fluid. Now, there really isn't a lot of that fluid in there, but it's going to be important for lubrication and cushioning. All right, now where do you not find the synovial membrane in the joint? When you look at that, where do you not find an area covered by, covered by that synovial membrane? The articular cartilage. The articular cartilage has no covering on it. You know, it's just simply bathed with that uh, joint fluid or that synovial fluid. All right. Articular cartilage, thin layer of hyaline cartilage covering the articular surfaces of the bones, all right, in other words, the epiphyseal ends, and it helps to resist wear and minimize friction if bones get compressed together. However, 
If you continuously grind one bone against the other, you're going to wear that away. And if you do, it is not replaced, and you end up with a nice, well, it's nice, but an arthritis, a lot of pain and grinding and everything, not much fun. The joint caps have two layers. The outer layer is dense connective tissue, essentially just collagen fibers, and essentially uh, making up what we would call a ligament. Ligaments bind bone to bone. And the outer layer, that outer capsule, is going to enclose all the other parts of, of the joint. And then the inner layer is that synovial membrane, which basically lines the joint except for what part? Articular, Articular cartilage, right. And it's only a few cells thick. It's largely loose connective tissue with a simple epithelium cover. And the whole idea with this is to filter the blood to produce synovial fluid. But in addition to making synovial fluid, the synovial membrane is also responsible for reabsorbing the synovial fluid. Because like with any of these body fluids, constantly being produced, constantly being reabsorbed. So the amount in a joint at any given point in time is more or less constant. Unless you've got an arthritis, in which case you'll probably have an elevated amount of synovial fluid. And if you get too much, that causes swelling, which causes pain. And you may have to have some excess fluid uh, removed. And you know, that can be done with you know, putting a needle in there and drawing it off. That's pain. All right, and as we said, that synovial membrane covers everything except the articular cartilage. And the cavity that's formed in there is the synovial cavity, which is then filled with that synovial fluid. So what's in the fluid? Well, the fluid is very viscous. In fact, it has kind of a consistency similar to egg white. And you know what that's like, all right? Why isn't that sticky like that? And it is. What has a lot of protein in it? So like with any body fluid, it's largely water, of course. And there's also going to be electrolytes. And there's going to be a fairly high, high concentration of protein. And it is rather viscous and sticky like if you, if you ever uh, have any to look at. You know, I've seen it. Well, anyway, there you go. And so it's constantly being produced, constantly being reabsorbed. There's not a lot of it because the knee joint is probably one of the largest joints we have in the body. And there's only about a half an ml of fluid in there at any given point in time. You know, it's less than an ml at normal. So, you know, other joints uh, like those that are let's say, between the carpals and the wrist, well, they're probably not going to have much more than about a good-sized drop of fluid in them. So there you go. But it's very important to have that because this fluid is for lubrication, and it also cushions the joints as well. And so there we go. Now, some optional parts. Not all joints are going to have these, but many of them do, like the knee joint does. The menisci, in the plural, the singular form of the word is meniscus. And all it is, all meniscus is, is just a little thin disc of fibrocartilage that projects into the joint cavity. All right? It's attached to a capsule on one end, and then part of it projects into the joint cavity. And like other parts in that joint cavity, it too is covered by the synovial membrane. What these do, they kind of divide joints up into compartments, and that helps oftentimes in uh, increasing the efficiency of the flow of the fluid around and its reabsorption and so on. So the distribution of the fluid fluid reabsorption is kind of aided by you know, the circulation of the fluid by these menisci. All right. 
And, now we've already said that, so on to the next one. Another option that you find associated with some joints is called a bursa in the singular. And if you just add an E on the end and have bursi, there's the plural. And there are a couple of these associated with the knee, for example. Uh, they are little fluid-filled sacs. And so really all it is is a connective tissue sac lined with a synovial membrane and filled with some synovial fluid. That's all it is. And the whole idea here, they're typically for cushioning. They are located between the skin and a bony protuberance or a bony part. Now, for example, in the case of the knee, we can talk about the pre-patellar bursa. Well, it's a little fluid-filled sac that is over the patella. It's more, you know, like anterior to the patella. Well, comes in handy when you're down kneeling on your knees, right? Gives you a little bit of cushioning that you otherwise wouldn't get. All right? There it is. Of course, now, you know, if you're going to be going a lot of that, you want something else to help it out. But nonetheless, uh, you know, that's the whole idea. And of course, if bursi get inflamed, what's that called? Bursitis. Right. All right. So there we go. Now, here is a diagram of a knee joint. So here we have the femur and the uh, tibia. And so there are the articular cartilages, all right? And here we have, of course, the joint cavity. And here is one of the meniscus. Here's another meniscus. They just protrude into the cavity. They're also covered with that synovial membrane, all right? The articular cartilage, not covered with it. And here is the patella, and there is the prepatellar bursa, which is that little pad, if you will, fluid-filled sac, made up basically of dense connective tissue, and then lined with a synovial membrane, and filled with a little bit of synovial fluid. So it's there to pad and protect that bony uh, patella. And so, you know, there we go. So this one's got menisci, it's got bursi, you know, it's just about about everything. One of those complicated joints, too, that we have in the body. All right, now, synovial joints, types of them, all right? Large number of types. Because, as we said, synovial joints are the most common type of joint that we have in the body. All right, ball and socket. Ball and socket. These are formed when you have a bone and a blood or a head inserted into a cup-shaped cavity and another bone. Well, how about what kind of readily defined? What about the hip joint? Now watch these stands when we pass them around. All right, here's the femur and here is the coxal bone. And we've got a little bit of motion, but it's a little bit restricted because of these fake ligaments that we've got. But in any event, it's a ball and socket. So we can have a go with that one. And uh, the socket, well, what is the socket in which the globular head is inserted? What's it called? And after all, here we have a femur, and there's the head. All right, and it goes into a socket. What's the socket in the coxal bone called? Starts with an A. Acetabulum, that's right. All right, now we've got another one. Now on this one, when you're passing it around, it's kind of a two-handed operation because this thing comes right off the stand. So if you're just holding it to the bone, Stand is likely to come popping off and dropping, and you don't want that to happen. So, yeah, do it with two hands. Shoulder joint. Now, what bone has the globular head in that case? Humerus. And the cavity is in the scapula. And what is the cavity called? It has a name. 
glenoid cavity. Right. Now, that glenoid cavity is not very deep. Right? Remember, it's very shallow. So, largely, what we have helping us out are ligaments to help keep that head of the humerus in that glenoid cavity. Now, that joint, that shoulder joint, has the greatest degree of mobility of any joint in the body. All right? That's the, the blessing part. But the curse, it's also the easiest one to dislocate. You can pop the humerus out of that glenoid cavity if you overdo it. Painful. Painful. All right? There you go. Because there's just not much holding it in there. It's not a very deep cavity. Unlike the hip, the acetabulum is quite deep. All right? Now, widest range of motion, rotational motion is possible with a ball and socket joint. All right? And that's about the only one that will give you rotational motion. Now, shoulder and hip joints examples. We've seen that. They're coming around. Here is a diagram of the hip joint with the femur, the head of the femur, inserted into the acetabulum. Okay? All right. So, ball and socket. Now, condyloid joints. Well, condyle-like, all right, what do we got? Well, we have an oval-shaped condyle on one bone and an elliptical cavity on another. Now, the hand... And there are several kinds of examples of synovial joints here, so we'll just take a look at this one first. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Now, condyloid joints are reasonably movable, but they only give you, uh, you know, they don't give you rotation. They'll give you a couple of planes they'll actually work in. And so this would be between the met metacarpals and the phalanges. So, there's a metacarpal, and there is the proximal phalanx. So there's the condyle, and there's the elliptical cavity. And we get it up here, and you can, you know, you can see how you can get that to, uh, you know, move with respect to one another. All right. So that is that's the condyloid, and so you know you can do that kind of thing, and you know, like with your fingers and. That sort of thing. So there we go. Now I'm going to hang on this for a minute. There's a couple of other types that we want to mention there as well. All right. So here we are. Metacarpal and phalanx, the proximal phalanx, and that acts in this. This is a condyloid joint. And of course, there is, and there's a synovial uh, um, membrane lining that, and you know, and, and the, uh, you know, the cavity filled with a little bit of fluid, not much more in a bra. Gliding joints. Now, gliding joints are where the bones are relatively flat, flat bones. And they basically just, you know, glide over each other, kind of twist. And a good example here, the wrist and the ankle, primarily. And if you think in terms of the wrist, what do we got? We've got carpals, little cubic-shaped bones. All right. Uh -oh. I knew that would happen. I'm terrible. All right. They, they glide over each other just a little bit. Okay? Now, you can also find that in the case of uh, the vertebrae to some extent and the ribs 2 through 7. Remember, those are the true ribs along 1, air 1, down to 7. Okay. Those can also have a little bit of gliding between the coastal cartilage and the sternum. All right, and here are the gliding joints in the carpals of the, of the wrist. You get the same thing, of course, with the, car, uh, the tarsus rather than the, in the ankle. And then a hinge. Well, now you all know where that's going to be. So there's another joint coming here. But I'll go ahead and pass that around. And you can examine the hand. All right, one bone, convex surface, fits into concave surface on another bone. 
And movement, though, is only in one plane. Of course, I did demonstrate that one for you quite a bit. That is, of course, like the elbow joint. And also, between the distal and medial phalanx, right? That only goes in one plane, doesn't it? All right? Well, here's the shoulder one coming. That's not the shoulder, the right hand. The elbow joint. All right, so here's the hinge part. All right, and that, of course, would be between what two bones in the case of the elbow? What's the upper bone? And the one that has the hinge, the ulna. Right. Okay. Now, there's another thing coming here in a bit with that one, because that's not the only motion we're going to find there. All right, here is the humerus, and here is the ulna, and there's the hinge joint. I only get one axis, uniaxial motion, only in one direction. Pivot. Well, a pivot joint is where there's a cylindrical part of one bone, and they rotate about the other. All right? And it could be, you know, rotating about the bone, but also within a, a ligament as well. And this next one coming up is both. All right. Rotation about a central axis. What have we got? Well, you can rotate the head from side to side. What bones are involved there? Atlas and axis, right? And there in the arm at the elbow. What bone is involved in letting me do this bit? The radius. That rounded head on the radius rotates around the all on the right. Because remember which side is the radius on here? The thumb side, right? So as you turn that, and you can turn that thing, as you can see, it rotates over so the radius always stays on the thumb side. But it has to rotate about the ulna in order to do that. Okay? All right. All right, there's the atlas axis combo. But, you know, we could go right back, let's say, to this one. And here, here's the radius. And of course, as you rotate your hand, that's going to turn as well. Okay. So, there we go. Oh, going the wrong way. Shame on me. Turn it around. Which way to go? All right. Saddle joints. Okay. Now, this is another one I think you're going to find involves the hand. Bones that uh, have concave convex regions. Movement in two planes, and here would be between the carpal and metacarpal of the thumb. All right, carpal here, back here, there is the metacarpal, and you know, you can do it, I guess, in two directions. You know, don't you kind of ignore the phalanges, the phalanx, you know, the phalanges. It's back, back here, because there is the carpal and the metacarpal. Okay, and there you go. And you can see that on the hand models coming around. So it's like here between the carpal and the first metacarpal. Because these are the phalanges out here. All right, so there we go. All right. Now, movements. Flexion. What do you mean by that? Demonstrate for us, that body. Flex your arm. All right. Flexing is less. What's the one where you're straightening it called? Extension. extension. All right. So we have flexion and extension. All right. There we go. All right. Flexion is bending. Extension is straightening it out. There we are, you know, flexion and extension. You know, it's kind of like ballet. Seems like that's what we want to use the legs for this. All right, hyperextension. Well, that's just extending beyond the regular position. All right, like if you hyperextend the head and neck, it's going to 
that, okay? All right. Now, doors of like my favorite terms. I have an aversion to this term. So. Dorsiflexion is bending the foot upward, you know, it's like toward the back, dorsal. And then plantar flexion is, you know, pointing your toes uh, toward the plantar surface, which is the sole of the foot, is the plantar surface. You know, that doesn't sound how, I don't know, I never took ballet. It doesn't sort of sound like ballet positions or something like that, or they might go like one, two, you know, I have numbers, and so. well, some of you probably had that, and they can quite adapt at it, but you know, it's not my thing, but anyway, there we go. Now, abduction and adduction, these are fairly easy. Abduction is away from the body midline, abduction is toward, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, I it's easy to remember this because if you've been abducted, you've been kidnapped, like right, you've been taken away. And abduction, like addiction, you know, you're dependent on something or drawn toward it, right? Abduct away from adduct toward. Alright? Those terms are used quite a lot, really. Alright, so abduction, abduction. You can see it again like ballet. Now, rotation and uh, on the next one is circumduction. But anyway, rotation is just twisting. That's it. All right. And then uh, circumduction is going in a circle. I you know, like that. I mean, who really cares? But anyway, um, supination and pronation. All right, now remember that anatomical position was supination, where the palms are forward, right? And remember now, that's what sets the business about the anterior, posterior on the arm. Anterior side with the palm, posterior with, you know, the back of the hand. I mean, that sort of thing, okay? All right, and then... Uh, so there we go. Rotation, circumduction, supination, and pronation. All right. Nobody knows how to go for those. Inversion, now let's refer to the foot. Inversion and eversion. Well, inversion is coming medially, and eversion is going out to the side of the body. It's really great. Yeah. All right. But again, you know, it's like ballet. <laughs> All right, and then protraction is moving apart forward, like thrusting out your chin, and retraction is bringing it back for its normal position. All right, and then elevation, raising apart, and depression, lowering. So what is a muscle that you would use to elevate the spine? Erect the spine. Remember that one? Yes, erect your spinning. That group is deep in the back on either side, really, of the vertebral column. Remember that? Yes. All right, now I think, okay, these are just some diagrams. I think we're done. All right, yes, now it's time. With a joint charge. Okay. Oh, oh I'm getting tired and weary, so I'm going to set to this one. Alright, I've got to get the pencil. I'm going to check them off as we go. Okay. Well, I don't know. I might start to talk and work our way down. That'd be the simplest. I had to get water. There wasn't coffee left. And that water and that fountain has such a metallic taste that it's terrible. But anyway, but it'll do. Okay, let me find the charge. Uh, no, that's cream and herbs. I can't get that one Ah, oh, here it is. Alright, well let's just start at the top. The first one that we have there is actually a gliding joint. 
All right, number one is gliding. All right, so now let's fill in, let's fill in the rest of it. All right, this is kind of the process of elimination, so I'll just help you out with some of this. All right, all right, structure. Well, they've already told us that. The S would indicate that it's synovial, okay? And that known axle or whatever, you can scratch that out. That's a mistake. That doesn't need to be there. All right, now, function. How would you classify the function? What we're looking at here is the degree of movement, which would mean S synarthrotic, A antiarthrotic, D diarthrotic. Now, what if we say if there are synovial joints, the degree of movement is diarthrotic, freely movable. All synovial joints are diarthrotic joints with respect to the degree of movement. All right, now, axial motion. Well, if it's gliding, what is it going to do? Slide right, two bones, one slides over the other, one or two directions, that's it. Uniaxial or biaxial? Uniaxial one direction, biaxial two. All right? That seem reasonable? All right, location. What is a location for a gliding joint? Wrist, right? All right, between the carpals and the wrist, anywhere else comes readily to mind? Ankles, right? Tarsals, intertarsal joints. Okay. All right. What was the axial motion? It's either uniaxial or biaxial. One plane, two, or two. All right. You can think of like, you know, you can like that or that. You know, it's kind of different. Now, the next one down, the second box, suture, is the sub subtype of the joint. And how would you classify them according to its structure? Sutures are fibrous joints, right. Now, what about function? What about motion? What, how, what kind of classification are you going to have for that? Synarthrotic, yes. No movement. Sutures, remember, the two joint bones are immobile. They don't move. Well, then. What are you going to say about axial motion? None. Okay. And location. All right. Any two bones of the skull, right? Frontal to parietal, parietal to parietal, parietal to temporal, right? Any of those. All right. The next one, the third one, is a syndesmosis. Syndesmosis. Structurally, how would you classify syndesmosis? Is it fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial? Fibrous, yes. All right. Now. Function, amphiarthrotic. All right, which means what? Slightly mobile, slightly movable. All right, what kind of motion do you get with this? Twisting is about it. All right, kind of a twisting motion. Now, location. Where's a good place to find the syndesmosis? Yeah, between the tibia and fibula. The distal tibia and fibula is, uh, that joint is a syndesmosis type joint. It's an interosseous ligament. Okay? Between two bones. Ligament between two bones. All right. Now, pivot is the next one, number four. All right. And pivot joints, structurally, how would you classify them? I think 
what are the three choices? Fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Out of the three, what is it? It's synovial. Most of these are only synovial. All right, pivot joints are synovial. Therefore, with regard to motion, how are you going to classify it? Diarthrotic, right. All synovial joints are diarthrotic joints. Freely mobile, freely movable. Now, uni or monaxial, obviously, because it's motion in just one plane, right? All right, now, what is a good example of a pivot joint? Atlas and axis, yes. And what's another one that comes readily to mind? We pass it around. Yeah, the radio ulnar joint. The radius and the ulna. Okay. Now, the next one, you shouldn't have any trouble coming up with that. Teeth to jaw. What is that subtype? The prettiest word of the bunch. Gomphosis. All right, now. Gomphosis. How would you classify it according to its structure? Uh -uh, uh uh Not synovial. Gotcha on that. Yes. No. Fibrous. Remember, it's just collagen fibers. So a gonfosis is like a suture in many respects. I mean, they're both just collagen fibers and they're immobile. And the only difference is with gonfosis, it's a, you know, it's like a cone-shaped part of one bone into a, little, into a cavity on another. Whereas the sutures, I mean, it's just where the two bones come together like pieces of a puzzle. All right, so it's fibrous and functionally it is synarthrotic. No motion, motion yet. And so axial motion for this one is none. And we already know because we were told it's what connects the teeth to the jaw. All right, hinge. How would you classify that construction? Synovial, yes. All right. And functionally, according to motion, it is diarthrotic. And what about axial motion? One axis, uniaxial. Because remember, it, it just goes in one direction. That's it. Okay. All right. Now, example. Elbow. Okay. All right, now, the next one. All right, I'll let you tell me what it is. It is cartilaginous and temporary. So what is the subtype? Cartilaginous and temporary. Synchondrosis, right. Synchondrosis. Now, how are you going to classify it according to motion? Functional classification is senarthrotic, right? No motion. None on the axial motion column. There's none. All right, now where do you find that? Where do you find it? If it's temporary, the epiphyseal plate of long bones, correct. That is a synchondrosis that's temporary. Now, what about one that is permanent? Remember, there was, there's a synchondrosis that's permanent. No? First rib and the new rib and the sternum. That that is permanent, but it's also a sinking roses. Okay, that one isn't on the sheet. All right, I'm just doing that. 
France here. All right, well, why don't you get your memory for it? All right, now the next one is condyloid. All right, so how, how would you classify that in according to structure? Yes, it's synovial, correct. And how would you classify it according to function? Diarthrotic, freely movable, yes. And what about axial motion? I think you'll find it's biaxial. You get two planes, basically. All right, now where would you find that? Metacarpals and phalanges. In fact, the proximal. All right, now the next one, cartilaginous, not temporary, so in other words, it's permanent, and not a synchondrosis, so what would it be? Synthesis, right, synthesis. Now, function on synthesis, how much motion do you get there? Some. What's the term that means some degree of motion? Amphiarthrotic. That's it. All right. And axial motion? Eh. Bending is about it. Bending, flexing. Let's just go with that. All right. Now, give us an example. Where can you find it? All right. Between the two pubis bones, right? The synthesis pubis or pubic synthesis, however you want to say it. And what's another one? Between the vertebrae, intervertebral discs. Okay? Now, the last one we have is a saddle joint. All right, saddle joint. Now, where, well, let's see, let's get the classification first. According to structure, it's classified as a Synovial joint, correct. And functionally, it is classified as a diarthrotic, right? And when it comes to axial motion, it's pretty much biaxial. Okay? Where do you find it? Well, we're already told. Thumb, right? Now, where in the thumb? Between the carpal and the metacarpal. That's the saddle joint. Okay? Now, there you go. Now, there's one we didn't use. What is it? Ball and socket. Didn't see that one. But that's all right. We're going to fill in the info for it anyway. All right, so ball and socket. How would you classify it according to its structure? Synovial, absolutely. And functionally, it's diarthrotic, right? And axial motion? Well, you could say rotational, because that will give you rotational motion. Most mobile of any of the joints, really. And where can you find a ball and socket joint? Shoulder is a good one, and where else? It. Right. That's pretty much it for ball and socket. Right? Yeah. Well, that's easy, isn't it? See? Look what you can do when you put your mind to it. Okay. Okay. Now we don't want the time. There we go. That's it. We can get a few terms on muscles. Now. When it comes to muscles, we're going to pay more attention in here to physiological aspects because we've already talked about specific muscles in lab. So we don't need to spend a bunch of time replowing that ground. So without further ado. Oops.
So, excuse me. Away we go. Well, characteristics of muscles. Five few things, but they all make the sense. Common sense, really. Excitability or irritability. What does that mean? That means they can take a stimulus. They can respond to a stimulus. All right. Now, when they respond, what do they do? They contract. They shorten. That's typically what they're going to do. When you stimulate them, they contract. All right. So they get short. Now, it doesn't really matter what kind of muscle you're talking about. They're all going to be able to do that. You stimulate them, they contract. Now, you want them to stay contracted. Well, not unless you want rigor mortis, which we'll get to later anyway. Uh, they have to be able to stretch and extend, and they have to be able to go right back to their original shape. That's elasticity. So, they can contract, they can relax and go back to their original shape and size, they also can be stretched within limits as well. All right? And if you stretch them, what do they do? They go back to their normal shape and size. So there again, that's part of their elasticity feature. All right? So if you stimulate them, they'll contract, they'll relax and go back to their normal position. You can also stretch them, in which case they will also return to their normal shape and size. Alright. Simple. Now, what do they do? Well, number one on the list is probably motion of some sort. Because what do they do? When you stimulate them, they tend to contract, right? That's the move of something. Now, the skeletal muscle, they're probably going to move you, right? When you walk around. Or when you sit, because that's maintaining posture. But what about have you had lunch yet? I have. I don't know about you, but you know, I'm going to get something after class. But what happens when you start filling up your stomach? Motility. Yes, it stretches and you get hypermotility going now. It's getting, you know, well, it's tight with muscle doing that. Maintaining posture. You're using that now. You're sitting there. Well, you've got muscles contracting to allow you to do that. I've got muscles contracting and allow me to stand and walk. All right, and another thing, too, goes along with sitting and standing, and our muscles are stabilizing joints. Because if you didn't, you know, those, all those nice uh, uh, synovial joints that are freely movable, if you didn't stiffen them and stabilize them, what would happen to you? You could plop right down on the floor in a heap. Right? Just a heap of bones. All right. Now, heat production. They're not number one. That's the liver. Because the liver is the main metabolic organ in the body and responsible for most body heat. But muscle is probably number two. Skeletal muscle, particularly, number two. Somebody put something sticky on that door. It's disgusting. But anyway, probably coke. Something that's dried out. Um, if you get cold, what does your skin do to preserve heat? All right, you have goosebumps, right? That increase surface area. What happens to the dermal capillaries? Constrict, all right? But muscles contract and relax, contract and relax, and you get shivering. Why are they shivering like that? Generates heat. Because when they're in motion, they're metabolizing more glucose, and one of the results that you get from that is heat. You know, yeah, you get ATP, but you lose some of the energy as heat. All right? And, and muscle can give you that. Now, just another little aside, and this gets back to the liver. Suppose you come upon a corpse that's been dead for probably a while. You know, it's not rot away yet. I mean, you know, they're still intact and all that sort of thing. And you want to have some estimate of how long they've been dead. You know how I can do it? Jab the thermometer into the liver and see what the temperature of it is, and that'll let you tell about how long they've been since they expired. Yeah, well, there's another little tip there. 
All right. So there we go. Now, types of muscle. Now, we know there are three types. We talked about these in lab. We looked at them. We should have been able to identify them. Uh, skeletal muscle. What about it? That is probably the major type of muscle we've got in the body. It's the one that's attached to bones. It's the one that's responsible for maintaining posture and motion because it's pulling on those bones or acting like levers and it's causing you to move. And as we well know, with skeletal muscle, it is voluntary, which means what? Conscious control. Well, I mean, you made the choice to sit in the chair, right? You made the choice to stand up and walk, right? You know, if, you, if you're assuming everything's working properly, that's conscious control. Now, there's another muscle that we have some conscious control over. It's that dome-shaped diaphragm, that's skeletal muscle. Now, what about that? Well, it's responsible for breathing, right? Inhalation, exhalation. Can you hold your breath? Yeah, you can for a while. All right. So you have some conscious control over that. Can you increase your respiratory rate? Can you hyperventilate? For a while, yes. <laughs> you know, you can do that, right? That's a conscious decision. All right, here's another muscle. Another skeletal muscle that guards the anal orifice. Remember what the name of it was? We had it in lab. L yes, it's the anal sphincter. And e yes, the external anal sphincter, also known as the levitator ani. Right? Remember that one? All right. There you go. All right. You can keep that one constricted and hold things in for a while, but eventually. Like with the diaphragm, eventually the unconscious will arise. But it is skeletal muscle. Now, smooth muscle. Now, where do we find that? Well, smooth muscle is primarily in the walls of what we call hollow organs, like the GI tract or the alimentary canal. All right, that's a tube, right? Well, we've got at least a couple uh, layers of smooth muscle there in the wall of that. All right, uh, some places more than two. The stomach, for example, has three. But anyhow, that's smooth muscle. Uh, what's it doing in the GI tract? What's that smooth muscle doing there? It's moving food and stuff along. That's right. Mixing and moving things along. All right, can it speed up? Yes, under certain conditions. Can it slow down? Yes, under certain conditions. Do you have any conscious control over that? No, you don't. It's involuntary. And also, you find smooth muscle in the walls of blood vessels, particularly arteries and veins. All right? And the amount varies, but that can constrict or it can, you know, relax somewhat. It's just less constriction. And you get dilation of the vessel. All right, so if you want more resistance to flow, you constrict the smooth muscle. If you want less, well, you don't constrict it as much. All right, and there you go. All right, no conscious control. It reacts slower than skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle contracts and relaxes much faster. And then we, of course, have cardiac muscle. Now, where do we find that one? Walls of the heart. That's it. Now, Involuntary control over that thing. Goodness! I mean, you know, you don't want to have to, when you go to sleep, have to think to have your heart contracting, do you? All right. Now that's simple enough, isn't it? <coughs> well, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. So let me pick up there and get to the coverings of the muscle on Tuesday. But that may take long. Huh? Sign in sheet. Oh, I probably forgot to pass it around, but it's here. Um. I did forget to pass it around, so sorry about that. But anyhow, well, you've suffered enough. <laughs>